welcome and thanks for tuning in to AOA on this Thursday, March 10th. Folks, I am very excited. We are coming to you live from the Commodity Classic 2022 down here in New Orleans at the Convention Center. I am very excited to be sitting in the UPL booth. We're going to be talking to the fine folks from UPL throughout the show today, getting caught up on everything that is happening over here. But before we dive into that, folks, we did have some news yesterday. USDA released their March World Agricultural Supply and demand estimates. And as expected, we did see the USDA reduce that Brazilian soybean crop. They dropped it uh, just about 10 million metric tons. They brought it down to 127 million metric tons. And they also shrank the crop coming out of Argentina. They dropped it 43 and a half million metric tons. That's one in 1.5 million tons lower than it was in February. So that short crop in South America continues to shrink. So we will continue to have updates on that, of course, here on AOA. But first, let's talk what's happening here at UPL. I'm very excited. We are talking with Joe Vassius. He is the food value chain lead with UPL. And Joe, boy, isn't it exciting to get back and connect in person with growers from across the country? It is for sure. It's great to see the energy that everybody's bringing here and hopefully have a good turnout this week at Commodity Class. Certainly. And there's so much to see when you come down here. Joe, if they make their way here to the UPL booth, and hopefully they should, booth 5412 or right across the aisle, got a couple of locations, what can they expect to learn? Tell us a little bit about UPL. What should folks know? Yeah, so UPL, we're a you know, a crop protection manufacturer that's uh, got a, a great footprint in the U.S. and across the globe. Uh, we've got a very broad range of uh, more traditional chemistries and then also uh, coming with more innovative solutions and then also a lot more biological options as well to really try to, to meet those evolving needs that the growers have here. So. When you think about those needs, specifically the needs that UPL addresses on a day-to-day -day basis, where do you feel the focus is for this company? You know, especially uh, within the, the row crop commodity market, um, you know, herbicides and herbicide resistance and dealing with that to really give growers options and the flexibility to tailor what they need. Uh, in those markets, we know that weed resistance is one of the biggest issues that growers face uh, year after year. Joe, is weed resistance ever just going to get better on its own? I don't think so. I mean, it's a proactive management type thing, right? And we can hope that it gets better, I think, but it's uh, it's ever evolving for sure. It is. And those challenges continue to pop up and it, it helps remind us all why we need to work together, why we've got to have collaboration in the industry to address these challenges. And that makes me wonder, I see as I look around the booth and of course folks can tune in to us. We are streaming live on Facebook and across the social media sites. Hopefully you can catch us there. And if you do, you'll see the UPL Open Ag logo. Joe, what, what is Open Ag? Yeah, so open ag um, has been a, a term that UPL has been using. Really, it's it's our different approach to the market. So trying to have a little bit unique approach to the market and really trying to have an open mind of how we bring products to market, you know, collaboration um, within our own companies and then, you know, between different companies as well. Um, and then also, you know, just uh, generally trying to have a platform for bringing new and innovative uh, options to the market. So how does it work? Joe, what is it that makes the open egg concept unique in this industry? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the, the things is, you know, open collaboration and innovation is what we're really talking. So we have, a, you know, our new open egg centers, a research center uh, in North Carolina. Um, there we have a team of scientists that are working um, with many of the startups um, that are out there with newer biological technologies that may not have resources to get products to market, but they can partner with us and our distribution network um, to hopefully bring those to a broader audience to to help growers out. As you've been exploring this, and how long has UPL been pursuing this this open ag idea? Uh, it's been roughly three years, I think, is kind of when that that approach really kicked off, and it just continues to evolve every year. And how have you found it be responsive to the challenges growers are facing on the ground? I think that it's um, it's very good. I mean, especially we've been faced with a lot of challenges over the last couple of years with the pandemic and everything, right? So really, just being flexible and able to evolve and and trying to take a look at doing things different when we know that's how business is being done differently as well. It's been hugely beneficial during the, the whole pandemic. In what way? How, how did you see it being beneficial? Because this was a time we had distributed work. You probably had folks working from home and across the country. How did it all work together? How does a company like UPL make a pandemic work, plus all of the issues we've got in the economy, and then still have all the products farmers are going to need come growing season. Yeah, and I, I think that this really points back to, you know, UPL as a company. You know, we've been around just over 50 years. Um, and, you know, the, the company has really had a strong emphasis on their manufacturing capabilities, right? So 
having that and having a lot more within our control that way um, that, you know, really has helped us try try to get the products to the growers uh, where they need them, when they need them as well. And then, you know, again, adapting, you know, to this virtual world, I think a lot of stuff has been adapted to, to working virtually the last year or two as well. Joe, look with me out to the future. This is changing. We're seeing the technology in crop protection just evolve at an incredible rate. How do you feel this open open ag approach to the market is going to work with growers and, and give them more options to your products longer term? Yeah, I think that, you know, a big focus for us has been really getting as close to working as we can with the growers so that we can understand what their problems are. Uh, and then again, using that R&D infrastructure that we have to hopefully tailor options as as growers need them and hopefully before they need them so that that's available uh, as those challenges arise so just really being more involved with the growers being involved making sure you're, you're with them every step of the way i understand that is a huge process of of just making sure you can meet the farmer's needs despite the challenges happening on the ground which are always popping up aren't they joe yeah exactly for sure in your role day-to-day -day at upl joe what do you find yourself doing as the food value chain lead yeah, so this is a fairly new uh, position for UPL. Um, really, again, trying to get closer to those growers, um, working a lot with commodity groups, uh, processors to really evolve, uh, evaluate their needs, really to you know collaborate with them where we can. Um, and then another portion of that has been helping with export issues as well. So as global regulations continue to change uh, and export conditions change, um, helping to know that we can provide that support for our products also. You know, when we think about exports and the world of international trade in 2022, my goodness, it's a minefield. But specifically, I would imagine in the crop protection, it's it's the phytosanitary, it's the other concerns that trading partners throw up. Do you feel like we're we're going to be having more opportunities at the market for for folks that are using the latest in in crop technology? I think so, and I think it's a, a an evolving uh, regulatory environment for sure, right? So on phytosanitary. Um, crop residue issues as well. What I mean, it's going to eventually influence if you know where your product is going, it's going to influence what product you can use here and really evolving to meet all the global needs and regulations as well. To meet the global needs. And it's incredible how we're able to to find premiums and to find niche markets and to be nimble, to have that open ag concept, the ability to jump, find what works in specific places and carry it to others really seems like it is going to be a, a factor in your success here this year with all of the volatility that's happening. Definitely. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that approach is really going to benefit us here moving forward. No, oh, man, Joe, it is something else. As you think about some of the other challenges you're facing, looking out to this growing season, of course, growers are, are a little nervous. Let's meet that with some optimism. What are you fired up about? Of course, a little bit later on, we're going to have it announced, but I don't want to tease that quite yet. But you guys at UPL always have new things coming out. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think that we're really excited. We have uh, James Cody here, who's one of our marketing managers, who will be uh, joining here later in the show. Um, he's going to have an exciting announcement for you. But uh, again, just trying to get some more products and offerings to the market as soon as we can um, with one of those that we're going to be announcing here shortly uh, coming to the market this season. Fantastic, folks. Stay tuned. All right, perfect. All right.
we go. Hello, folks. Welcome back to AOA. Thanks so much for making us a part of your day. If you are down in New Orleans for Commodity Classic, come by and see us. We're hanging out at the UPL booth, booth 5412, coming to you live from the trade show floor. And I tell you what, it is so fantastic to get out and see people in person one more time. One of the things I love about the ability to do this is you never know who you're going to wander around down here in new orleans i had the chance to run into our good friend mike steenhook the executive director of the soy transportation coalition and given the emphasis on supply chains recently mike i figured it was time to check in with you bring us up to speed the world is in chaos it seems how are soybean supply chains holding up well you know overall uh the the supply chain the currency for it to run effectively is predictability it's reliability and we've had a real significant amount of, of unreliability and unpredictability over these last couple of years, you know, prompted by COVID. But now all of a sudden you're, you're inserting things like the war in Ukraine that is adding insult to injury. So we're, we're expecting you know, not only things like an escalating cost of fuel, but then also positioning and repositioning all of these assets um, around the world. These are large ocean vessels and you just can't simply pivot on a dime. So we anticipate that we're going to continue to have some significant supply chain disruptions in the foreseeable future. And, and that's obviously a real concern. Mike, as we think about where these assets are, these global trading assets, the massive ships, the, the trains that are carrying all of these grains around the world, were we pulling away from the Black Sea region because of the tensions prior to the war or did we legitimately lose a lot of capacity that's trapped over there. Yeah, I mean, we were obviously there were storm clouds on the horizon and that was that was certainly having some degree of impact. But then when all of a sudden the invasion occurred, there were there was a lot of shipments that wanted to go out of the Black Sea, a lot of them that wanted to come in. And then all of a sudden that was just a real wrench thrown in the gears of that of that particular region. And so there's there's cargo that's stranded. There's assets that are stranded in the area. And, and the, the point is, is that a ship over there ultimately is going to find its way over here. And so all of a sudden, if you strand one of those ships or if you they have to take a major detour, that has an impact over here as well. And that's one of the things that I try to underscore is the interconnectivity of our supply chain. That's a great point. And Mike, as we think about the interconnectivity, boy, everything is connected right now are the the weakest links you're nervous about as you look out into this growing season into growers getting supplies and then of course the exports we're going to have to do with all of these beans well you know we we've got obviously a lot of challenges throughout the supply chain but you know this kind of you know this trans global oceanic kind of of of, of transit that's something that's real concern right now just to, again you, you have to understand that the whole system is predicated on predictability when you deploy a ship full of 2.5 million bushels of soybeans, you're not going to deploy that unless you know for sure it's going to get to that destination. And you're not. And so all of this activity is predicated on predictability. That's something that's really concerned as we see as we're seeing this increasingly unreliable, unpredictable world that we're living in. Mike, let's take Ukraine out of the, the, this discussion for right now. Eventually, we'll get those assets moved. Eventually, the markets will react and, and set up a, a, a quarantine for the goods coming out of that area. For the rest of us in the broader world, as you think, the, the soybean supply chain, getting American beans over to China, we're seeing those purchases increase. Are we building the right infrastructure we need? How's the deepening of the Mississippi coming? That's, you know, clearly it's a bit of good news. And, and so this is really one of the themes that we're trying to convey to farmers down here is, is what happens down here impacts what happens up there, i.e. the Midwest. And what happens up there impacts what happens down here. So the, the profitability of the American farmer, particularly soybeans and corn, is really impactful by how effective we are at maintaining this channel. We're very pleased to see we're making progress on the deepening of the lower Mississippi River from a minimum of 45 feet to eventually 50 feet. This is a project that got the green light in February of 2020, and we're actually making progress on that deepening uh, work. We're now at 48 feet at this stretch of the river. 
And anytime you add an additional foot, uh, you're essentially adding 100,000 bushels of capacity per vessel of soybeans by just simply doing that. That just dramatically improves the economics of our industry. One foot of additional depth equals 100,000 bushels of soybean capacity per ship? Yeah, and so eventually going from that 45 feet to 50 feet, it's really the difference between 2.4 million bushels of soybeans to 2.9 million bushels of soybeans. So, you know, when you're, when you're an industry that operates on a very tight margin, and you make your money by having that tight margin multiplied by millions and billions of bushels, any opportunity to shave some cents off that delivered price is very meaningful. Well, speaking of that delivered price, China, of course, massive buyer of soybeans, not just from the U.S., but also Brazil. Mike, we've got harvest underway down in South America. Concerns are growing about the size of their soybean crop. How do you see the logistics changing for all of those ships that are waiting to load out of Brazil, but might not get the beans they want and, and maybe not at the price they want either. They gonna come to our shores? Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that real strong demand pull coming out of the United States. And obviously from a logistics perspective, you know, you, again, you have these ocean vessels that are kind of, the plan was to, to move them out of Brazil, uh, simply making a U-turn and saying, well, I'm just gonna take a left here instead. You know, I'm just gonna go to the US instead. That's a, that's a real expensive endeavor. But yeah, we are gonna see more of those assets positioned here. And it, it certainly is going to have an impact on the, the volume coming out of the United States. So, you know, obviously we don't wish any ill will on our friends in South America, but yes, we expect to see some more vigorous export activity out of the United States. But we've got to be able to get the beans to that export facility and then get them loaded. So to do that, we need workers, of course. We need truckers. We need workers on the railroad. And we need workers at the ports. And I know we've got some labor potential uh, uh, challenges coming on the rail side, could you talk a little bit about what Canadian Pacific is discussing? Yeah, the, their their union recently voted by a 90 plus percent vote to actually authorize a strike starting as early as March 16. Uh, we obviously hope that that does not occur because a lot of fertilizer comes into the United States from Canada. The Canadian Pacific Railroad is a major conduit for fertilizer coming into the U.S. So, you know, we're having all of the stress on our inputs that would add you know, injury to insult on that as well. Uh, another issue that is very germane for global shipping is this contract negotiation between the, the ocean vessel companies and the workers on the West Coast called the International Longshoremen and Warehouse Union. Their contract is up in July. And you know, what usually happens every time there's a contract negotiation is you might see some works, you may not see a full blown strike, but at least a, a slowdown to kind of really elevate their negotiating position. And um, again, it's never a good time to have a work stoppage or slowdown on our ports. It would be a particularly a bad time for that to occur right now. Mike, soybeans specifically, as we're thinking about the Longshoremen and Warehousing Union, would they be on the bulk container ships as well, or are they containers, or do they cover both? Yeah, so the, 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 the negotiation right now is mainly for the container vessels, whereas the bulk, the bulk shipments, they, they operate under a separate contract with the union or even sometimes with the local union. So this wouldn't be so much affected by the negotiations currently that's, that's, you know, that's being discussed right now. But for those exports via containers that go through places like Los Angeles, Long Beach, that certainly would be impacted, as well as our friends in the meat industry that send refrigerated cargo of pork and of poultry products and beef over to, to Asia, they certainly would be impacted as well. So it clearly is something that is uh, top of mind and, and we certainly implore, implore those participants to, to make sure that this supply chain is operating as efficiently as possible. Let's talk broadly about the supply chain. We've seen those incredible stresses over the past two years, both due to COVID and then due to the increased purchases that Americans were making. Mike, broadly is the logistics industry getting this supply chain situation sorted out we're still uh, under significant stress and you're seeing the numbers, you know, with vessels being queued outside of Southern California, um, a lot of the other challenges that, that we're still in the midst of all of this. Now, a lot of prognosticators suggest that we might have hit the, the apex of it. And over the course of 2022, it may moderate to some extent, uh, just given the fact that in inflationary pressure is going to have an impact on consumer spending. We, we, we would certainly argue for that. Um, but then with, with an escalating fuel costs, that's going to make our supply chain more expensive as well. So it, it, 
I guess the bottom line is we're hoping for it to moderate a bit during the course of 2022, but we think this is this supply chain stress is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Boy, there's always going to be something to talk about. Mike, the good news is, as this year goes on, we should start seeing more of that infrastructure money coming out and start getting some more updates on how we're going to be spending that money to improve our overall export abilities. Don't you expect? We expect that not only with, with rural roads and bridges that are very meaningful, but obviously a big project that we've been pining for for years is Lock and Dam 25 on the upper Mississippi River. We expect to see some work commence on that later this year. And and that's going to be a real shot of encouragement for farmers who've been pining for that for many years. Lots of things to look forward to as this crazy growing season gets ready to get started. Folks, stay with us. When we return, we'll have more coverage from the UPL booth here at Commodity Classic 2022.
back, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for making AOA a part of your day here on this Thursday. I mentioned we are very excited to be at the Commodity Classic. We are on the convention center floor this morning, live from the UPL booth, booth 5412. You are going to stop by here if you are down in New Orleans this week. We're talking today with James Cody. He is the strategic marketing manager with UPL at James. I'm really excited to pick your brain because as I look around this booth, I see the accoutrements of an announcement. UPL is coming with a big announcement at the show this week. What are you guys bringing to the table? Yeah, great. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And we're excited about being at the show. We're excited about being at Commodity Classic. And it really is a great venue and opportunity to announce a launch like what we're doing today. So today we're, we're announcing the launch of Preview 2.1 SC Herbicide, which is a two to one ratio of Metribuzin and Sulfentrazone for the pre-emergent soybean market and really believe that it's going to be the foundation to a solid weed resistant management program for our soybean growers. All right. Well, tell us why, James. Why do we need Preview 2.1 SC as we look ahead to the 2022 growing season? Yeah, I think when you, the resistant management piece that we want to go take care of and make sure that we give the soybeans a good early start, you know, that, that old starts start clean, stay clean philosophy, it really fits in as a cornerstone to that piece of it. That makes a lot of sense. And James, as you think about the excitement level for new products, as that weed resistance continues to be an issue and grow across the country, how do you see this working into growers' plans for this season? Yeah, again, I think starting clean, having that, that foundation set, and then that will move into is we, we think there's good uh, ex residual, extended residual control that will, you know, really maybe help give us a um, longer period before that second flush of weeds comes on. Okay. So putting us in a nice position for that post application as needed. All right. Well, you mentioned the active ingredients and I'm yes. not enough of a science guy to repeat them. Why don't you run through us? What chemical action are we using here with Preview? Yeah. So we've got two active ingredients. Metribuzin is the first one, which is a group five herbicide. And then we have sulfentrazone, which is a group 14 herbicide. So both are, you know, we have an opportunity around, especially those hard to control broadleaf weeds like a Palmer amaranth or water hemp, red root pigweed, um, and, and mare's tail really have a good control on those resistant weeds. So a lot of growers and more and more, it sounds like, and James, I imagine you've had these conversations with producers across the country. The move has been to a full spectrum program. We've got to manage our crop protection from all aspects. As growers move towards that model, where do you see Preview 2.1 SC fitting in? How can we, how can we drop it into our existing program? Yeah, you know, again, I think that start early first. And, and depending, what's nice about Preview 2.1 is that it does have the flexibility to be a good tank mix partner also. So it gives growers the opportunity to, you know, depending on what in their field, what's going on, or other weed spectrum out there, that it has that flexibility to add a, an esmetolachlor or a pendimethalin in there as well to make that wider spectrum for their needs. What should growers be planning on for application dates? How is this going to, to fit with their, their crop planting and spraying situation? Yeah, so you're going to want to start before, uh, before the seed is planted all the way up to before the crop comes up out of the ground. So it does have the flexibility from a timing perspective. The other opportunity, it does have a fall application label. So where you have the opportunity to, uh, to make a fall application, you can do that as well. Effectiveness, spring application versus fall application. Have you had good, strong results from both? We have. I, I think the spring is where we're really focused this year, obviously, and I, I think that's where we'll continue to focus. But, you know, depending on what the, the growers program is, I think, you know, again, it can fit in that fall application as well. Now, you mentioned preview is going to buy those growers that little extra time. Of course, those windows of freedom from spraying in the summertime when life is hectic are right. crucial. Right. James, how much of an extra window could growers expect with preview? Yeah, so what we've seen in our in our data is that, you know, we can have up to 43, 50 days of good residual control with Preview 2.1. And what crops are you anticipating Preview should be used in? So primarily soybeans. That's where we'll start with. Um, it is also labeled in sugarcane, potatoes, and some other minor crops. But primarily, we're going to be focused this first year on soybean in the Midwest. James, anytime you're coming up with, with new products, new technologies, and you've got to get them out to the growers, right? We, this new technology doesn't do us any good if it's sitting in a box and a shelf. It's got to be in the field helping right. keep them clean. 
in order to do that, you got to get the story out. So you're here at yes. Commodity Classic. UPL's got a fantastic setup. Talk to us a little bit about what this announcement is going to look like here this week. Yeah, I think we're going to, you know, whether it's these, the interviews, the stuff that we have going on in the booth, the other things, we have an additional booth where we're talking about preview specifically as well. So folks that are here, please stop by that, that additional preview booth and provide more information. What can they expect? If I'm looking around. We're sitting in the preview booth. For those of you tuned in to us on virtual, you can catch us. This program is streaming live on Facebook. So do be sure to check that out at the America Agriculture of America website. You can see me talking to James, but we're here in the preview booth and it's set up like a movie theater over yeah, there. Exactly. James, what are, what are we doing? Yeah, are we getting so, a preview of preview? Absolutely. We're, we're thinking about the premiere of preview, but for sure, yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. And you'll have that, that feel to it. So come and watch a little trailer about um, preview. And ultimately how we see preview is it gives growers the opportunity to give a preview of what their field's going to look like at the end of the year. That's fantastic. As you think about the research that you've done in building preview and in bringing it into market, how has it performed on the ground? What type of research have you done? How can we put some some knowledge in these farmers' back pockets as they're making their purchasing decisions for this spring? Yeah, for sure. So the, you know, multiple years with the UPL as well as with university studies as well. And I think if, you know, what we're reading in literature today and, and a lot of university professionals as they think about Metribuzin specifically, you know, really is that important piece to that, again, the foundation of um, weed resistance management. And so working with universities, we've been able to, to continue to, to drive that home. And as you look out, as as this spreads, is is preview going to be available for growers all across the country this year? Or are you rolling it out in specific geographies? We're rolling it out in specific geographies, and so the uh, and we're also um, as we continue to gather state registrations as well. So as we look at this season, it's really kind of a limited launch where we're going to be very targeted with our our geographies. Which of our listeners tuning in should have their ears perk up? Maybe they're in the geography. What states are you targeting here in 22? Yeah, so, you know, again, primarily the Midwest. When we think about Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Minnesota, uh, and then the Dakotas as well. And, of course, this past year, a lot of that territory saw struggles with drought. As we think about the weather impact on our overall crop protection system, do we have good staying ability in the soil with Preview? Have you found that... Well, even when the weather gets crazy in the spring, it, it sticks around and does its work. Yeah, and I may I may let Lynn answer that in a second, but the uh, but I, I think we you know you do it does need to be incorporated. You do need moisture to get it to get it going. But yeah, I think we'll be okay in those situations. It is going to be very exciting, James. You've been working on this, I'm sure, for a while with the scientists and the team to get this out to the public. As this year pushes forward. When should folks be planning that that application if they're able to get into the geography and really put preview to work on their farm this year? Yeah, again, I think that that kind of two weeks before up through emergence of the crop is the right time to make the two application. Two weeks prior up through emergence. And then are there any registration concerns they should have label concerns for, for post-emergence application or is it strictly pre? Strictly pre. Yeah, no Fantastic. post. Fantastic. Now, Farmers, of course, have been looking for more and more tools to combat weed pressure. James, thinking about having these conversations, what are some of the biggest concerns you hear from growers out there across the countryside? I mean, is it really just its resistance? I think resistance is obviously an extremely important part of it. And the other thing is you, you talked about is labor is an issue also. So one of the other advantages of Preview 2.1 is it is a liquid formulation. And so I think from a convenience perspective, I think that'll fit well into the growers program and again everybody has labor issues whether it's the grower retailers all the way through to from manufacturing and when we think about labor the ability again to get that little extra coverage to get that residual effect buying you a little more time that could be the difference That's from correct. having labor versus not as we get here into the summer james the preview is getting started you're going to have folks here at the upl booth for all three days is that correct that's correct how should they just wander up and say, hey, tell me about Preview? How should they be coming up here to learn about these new products that you guys are developing yeah, at UPL? Get close. I think when you when they get close, we will we'll have somebody reaching out to them to, to come in and learn more about Preview. And then also the, the whole portfolio that UPL has to offer. You know, I think UPL in general has a great portfolio for soybean growers. So depending on where they're located, what their needs are from a, from a weed perspective, I feel like UPL has an answer for them. 
as we're thinking about those other products in the UPL portfolio, James, we've got about a minute left. Is there anything else that you think growers need to have in their mind as they're preparing to put their seed in the ground for this season? Yeah, again, it's that's that starting early and and starting clean, and then we do have a good a good uh, portfolio of post-emergent uh, products as well. So give them the flexibility, something like an inner line. Um, and we have we do have esmetola chlors as well. So again, thinking about that that early season opportunity, there may be an opportunity to to premix something like a moccasin in with that with that preview two point one as well. All right. And James, if we've got listeners near who cannot make it to New Orleans for the Commodity Classic, but they've got access to the Internet, where can they go to learn more about Preview and how should they do it? Yeah, so for sure, reach out to their local retailer, have a conversation there, and then we do have a a website as well. And what is that website? We have that one offhand or we will be getting it from Lynn here in just a second, folks. So stay tuned. And you can always remember, just Google Preview 2.1 SC from UPL, and I'm sure it'll take us right there. We've been talking to James Cody. He is the strategic marketing manager here with UPL. And James, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. And folks, stick around when AOA returns here from the Commodity Classic floor at the UPL booth. We'll be talking with Lynn Justison, so don't go away.
more information, Lynn Justice and Technical Services Lead joins us. And Lynn, we were talking about the website with James. You've got that on hand. Where can folks go to learn about Preview? Oh, you bet. Thanks, Mike. So um, first and foremost, if you're looking for specific information about Preview, um, go to previewherbicide.com or for all the rest of the great UPL products and all the products that we have available to our, our growers and our listeners out there, go to upl-na.com. So Lynn, your role at UPL, you are working with a team of agronomists across the central part of the country. Tell me, what are the challenges you're hearing from growers? Yeah, that's a, so Mike, last year, um, our team, we went out uh, and went specifically to growers and asked them that. It wasn't, it, it, we, uh, we really tried to open it up to not just things that are that would relate to us. What are all of your challenges? And we had a wide range of things from some of the things James mentioned. He mentioned labor, right? That labor, there were spots that was more than others. But the one thing that rang clear across all those that was consistent was resistance management, right? In particular, anything to do with an amaranth uh, in corn and soybeans, um, whether it's Palmer amaranth in the South or it's water hemp in the North. Consistently, acre to acre, grower to grower, that was one that was always in their top five. Yeah, nobody wants to go back to getting a hoe out there and walking through these fields to deal with resistant weeds, do they? <laughs> no, we're doing all we can to avoid metal in, in fields other than planters and combines, it seems like, for sure. And so we were talking with James about the advantages to Preview 2.1 SC, and we spoke about the, the delay, the additional clearance you get from that second flush of weeds. How long are you, exp how long are you seeing on the ground? So I think really what's I think a realistic expectation of that is James mentioned that 40 to 50 days that we're seeing a residual control and seeing exceptional control. I think what that buys us over what a lot of programs are is another 14 days, another 14 to 21 days. Now, again, that depends on rainfall, depends on heat, it depends on a lot of things and use rate and all those sort of things, but it, it does buy us some time and sometimes that's that little window, you know? And if, if you think, and, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak maybe just a little bit bigger and overarching with that, Mike, is that that if you go back and you start thinking about this, and this is a great lead into, um, you know, there's a lot of things going in our in our business. You know, we have all time highs in commodities. We have we have stress levels and stretched and stretched um, supply, um, and it's to crawl all the way across our industry. I think we have really have to plan, and I think we need to be big and we need to be robust in what we do in pre, in pre emergence, and we need to control all we can then because we not only that, but we are we'll get one shot at post emerge probably. And any sort of a cleanup trip, it's not that we can't do it. It may be hard to get the supplies to make it happen. So I think that that ultimate planning, James mentioned to that, big, robust, full rates, get products on the ground, and we're, we're employing things in, into the field, and, and we're getting back to where we're very robust on that. And then we come and we follow that back up with a post-emerge, and we have to be on time. Now, the trick with this is, and the beauty of this is, is we get to think about weed sizing. If we buy 14 more days, we've expanded our window out. Instead of 21 days, we now have say 30 days. Well, I, that's a seven day window. I might be able to get it on time and make the right application. So I think that's of critical importance. I think the other thing that preview brings to it um, with that, what we've seen in our, in our, in our research and our extensive research the last three years with it, um, it one James mentioned, but it's a liquid formulation that makes it extremely easy to handle. The other thing we're seeing is, is our crop safety is, is, is better than the industry standards. So uh, a 20 to 30% increase in crop safety, I think that's huge. Plus, so more crop safety, longer window of application, and we're controlling tough weeds. This thing is built specifically with, again, two existing chemistries. It's built specifically to go after resistant weeds. It's built, the ratios are that way. Everything is built at that product. Yeah, at laser targeted. You mentioned amaranth, and my yeah. goodness, I hear that from every single grower. It is scary to see that moving north. Let's yeah. talk as you're out there in the field, you're watching your crop. One of the greatest things we can do, Lynn, is to be a student of the crop. What does that mean? So I, I'm going to I'm going to take and relate that. I think UPL brings you a bit of a different perspective from who we are. Um, if you look at our tech development, I'm I'm going to brag on us a little bit. I have five agronomists that run across the row crop area, um, plus myself within that. So that puts six of us in that area. And if you look at that, I think that's really what we're there for as students. Again, we spend half of our time in research trials. A lot of the rest of our time is with growers doing strip trials and large trial things. So that leads us, leads us to be students of the game. And I think we can take and portray that right to the growers. The best and the most, the growers that, that we, uh, we, we kind of gravitate and find ourselves working with are the best are the ones that they do this. They plan. They know that. I have a, I have a grower in particular, unfortunately, uh, Pawnee Creek Farms. Uh, they won the state this year, National Corn Grower uh, for Nebraska. Um, that particular farm and that outfit, 
second year in a row they've won it. Um, um, Braden is a trusted advisor. I'm his trusted advisor. But the beauty part of what Brad does is we were going through his corn program. He has five different modes of action to get his to keep his soybean cops clean. And none of them are, they're all layered in. He's got some that duplicate, but never close together. There's layered and sequencing to this that these fields are, are, they're not perfect, but they're as clean as you find. I think that sort of student in the game is great. And the student in the game, honestly, you need to go back now and you should have been, you make notes in the combine. You make notes where you're at. You use whether it's your, whether you're using a satellite imagery or if you have some drone imagery or there's some other things you do, you take that, you start dissecting, where are my issues at? How do I get better at it? Um, can I overcome it? If I can't, can I take that money, minimize how much money I spend there, and let's go and spend some more over here and maybe optimize what we're doing in a farm? So I think to me, that's the student of the game. It's not any one thing. It's not relying on everything. It's being flexible. It's having that as you move along, have a plan in place, have a backup. And if you need to move, you move. But if not, I think if you, if you put a good plan in place, 90% of the time, you're going to be able to execute that um, and have fantastic results. Put that plan in place and start planning for 2022 uh, today if you're behind the eight ball. Lynn, yeah, I yeah. know you're going to have a lot of planners coming through the booth here in yeah. a few minutes. So this thing is going to be opening up. But before we let you go, one more time, where can folks go for information on Preview? Oh, uh, Preview specifically, um, let's go to previewherbicide.com. And then for all the other UPL products, go to upl-na.com. Folks, if you are down in New Orleans at Commodity Classic, make it a point to come by the UPL booth, booth 5412. You can't miss it. There's yellow and orange, bright colors everywhere. They're ready to talk about the changes to technology coming in crop protection. Big thanks to our friends at UPL for the opportunity to be here today and tune in tomorrow. We'll have more AOA from Commodity Classic. Thanks for listening, everybody.